makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Tom McKenzie in London with the conversations that matter. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. From cars to coal, the dramatic collapse of the Baltimore Bridge will cause weeks or even months of transport delays, adding another disruption to global trade. Japan steps closer to intervention as the yen slumps to its lowest level against the dollar since 1990. Plus, H&M jumps, the fashion retailer posts better than expected profit in the first quarter as its spring range draws shoppers. Let's check in on the stock story then of the moment on Wednesday. As we look across the map here, across the European benchmark, the stock 600 is currently flat at the top of the list when it comes to sectors. Retail on the back of that beat coming through from H&M. Here in the UK, as you can see, the FTSE 100 is currently in negative territory. France is flat. A little bit more positivity coming through on the DAX over in Germany. The DAX up a tenth of a percent. The FTSE 100 down three tenths. You can look to the commodity story for that. Softer iron ore and copper prices. Oil also lower in the session. And over in Italy, the FTSE MIB currently just eking into positive territory. That's a quick look then across the Eurozone and here in the UK. Let's flip the board and have a look at US futures after three straight days of losses across European uh, US stocks. Futures are looking slightly brighter this Wednesday. S&P E-mini is pointing up by three-tenths of a percent. NASDAQ futures pointed to gains of 64 points. And despite the three days of losses in the US, of course, we are still grinding towards five straight months of gains for US stocks. And there's the European benchmark currently uh, flat at 5.10.90. Let's briefly look cross asset. The asset of the moment really arguably is the, is the Japanese yen. Uh, you see at 151.50, they intervened at 151.95. The last time around, we've had some very strong rhetoric coming through from the finance minister warning of intervention on the weakness that we've seen in the Japanese currency. Of course, the yield differential between the US and Japan remains significant despite that move into positive territory for interest rates by the BOJ last week. So the Japanese yen remains in focus on those intervention possibilities and the rhetoric coming through from officials in Tokyo. The US benchmark 10 year 423. They auctioned a five year note yesterday, around $67 billion worth of five year treasuries auctioned, and that was relatively well received by the market. Spread $85 a barrel, off by 1.2%, as you can see in the session. A report coming through suggesting that inventories are starting to expand in the US. JP Morgan, though, and their analysts see the potential for $100 a barrel on oil before the end of this year on the supply cuts coming out of Russia. Now, officials in the U.S. city of Baltimore say active search and rescue operations have been suspended after yesterday's bridge collapse. Six people are unaccounted for and now presumed dead. The disaster happened when a cargo ship lost power and hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge. The state governor says a mayday call from the ship allowed authorities to limit vehicle traffic on the bridge. Let's get more on this story with Bloomberg's trade czar, Brendan Murray. Uh, Brendan, what is the situation then in terms of the impacts, the economic impact for Baltimore, but more broadly, the supply chain wrinkle that adds to the U.S. economy? Well, definitely. You heard the officials yesterday talk about how the, the port is such a, uh, a big employer uh, and, and, it, and it reaches far outside the city, so across the region. So what we're already seeing are ships... Uh, anchoring off of, of ports like Savannah, like Charleston. It's not a, it's not a large number yet. It's three or four. Uh, New York, uh, uh, some, some ships are diverting there as well. It's not a large number yet, but if, that, if those three or four turn into 12 or 15 in the days and weeks ahead, then, then we could see some, uh, you know, the, 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 the impact of this broaden out. But for the time being, people are telling us that, uh, the, that, that the impact will, uh, the immediate impact will be local and we'll have to keep a close eye on whether it spreads uh, regionally. Okay, so local in the immediacy, at least in terms, of, in terms of the largest impact, but you watch that spread and you and the team are across all of this. What is your understanding of other ports in the U.S., their ability to absorb this trade flow being diverted uh, away from Baltimore? And what kind of time frame are we looking at to get that port back up and running? Well, the, the ports that we've been talking to uh, say that they do have capacity. They'll say we're, we'll, we're willing to work uh, with Baltimore uh, to take some of that, that spillover cargo. Uh, so that is, a, and at the moment, demand 
isn't uh, going gangbusters in the U.S. economy. It's solid, but it's not. These ports are not at 100 percent capacity. Some of them are at 70 or 80 percent, so they can handle some of that. Uh, the difficulty will be in, on the auto side, where uh, Baltimore is the biggest uh, U.S. importer and exporter of, of, of cars and light trucks. So where can those where can those vehicles go if you've ordered a, a new car uh, and it was supposed to come through Baltimore? It's going to have to come through Brunswick, Georgia, now or some other place and be trucked or put on a uh, put on rail uh, to get to its destination. So th that's extra time, that's extra cost. Yeah, Georgia, obviously a huge diversion then uh, in, in that example. Uh, okay, Brendan Murray, thank you very much indeed. Of course, European automakers as well impacted by this, given uh, the, the need for Baltimore around VW, BMW and other European automakers in terms of the trade into and out of uh, the US. Brendan Murray, across all things with the supply chain impact of that, of course, bridge collapse in Baltimore. Thank you. Now, to Japan, which has stepped up uh, its scrutiny of the currency and currency intervention warnings with its strongest warning yet. That's as the yen slid to the weakest level in about 34 years against the dollar. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Paul Jackson then uh, for the details, what we've been hearing from policymakers. Uh, Paul, what have we been hearing from officials uh, in, in Tokyo? Is there uniformity in terms of what we've been hearing from the finance ministry, from, from the BOJ? How pronounced now is this risk of intervention? Uh, well, we're definitely a step closer. Uh, the key word used today was uh, we are uh, prepared to take uh, bold action against excessive moves. Uh, bold action is the coded language for direct currency intervention. And that's coming from uh, the finance uh, ministry. Uh, that's uh, aiming to uh, push back against these bets against the yen. And it did have uh, uh, some impact this morning, pushing uh, uh, the yen uh, up against uh, uh, the dollar and away from this uh, uh, low that we saw earlier in the morning. Uh, however, the central mm. point that you flick to there in your uh, question is that uh, if uh, officials in Japan were only concerned about the yen, then you would be expecting uh, Bank of Japan officials also to be helping the cause uh, by talking about uh, looming uh, rate hikes uh, that are going to come and uh, rescue the yen and uh, uh, ferry it back to uh, safer waters in the 140s or 130s. But that is not what we got from uh, uh, the Bank of Japan's most hawkish member, uh, Tamura, this morning, or from uh, the governor. Both of them uh, uh, keep hammering on about uh, the Bank of Japan maintaining easy conditions, easy financial conditions. Uh, so we've got a slightly uh, confusing message uh, coming uh, from the uh, policymakers in Tokyo, and uh, this doesn't uh, uh, help the situation uh, of the yen. And uh, part of this uh, stems to the fact that the uh, Bank of Japan has spent more than a decade mm -hmm. on this extraordinary program to try and generate inflation, not wipe it out, but to uh, 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 ferment it and get stable inflation. And just when it's got it, it doesn't want to be racing towards race hikes that might, uh, on the first hand, first uh, point, uh, wipe out the inflation and also mm. buckle the economy. And, and we've just had an economy that's just escaped a technical recession. Okay, so that tension is, is clearly there. Um, Paul, what are you and the team looking for then in the days and weeks ahead? What could prompt intervention and what are you outlooking in terms of what's essential for this currency going forward? Well, I think we're at a bit of, bit of a hairy moment here because we do have uh, the holiday weekend coming in, Good Friday, and so we could have limited liquidity in markets, which could lead to uh, big moves that might have to prompt uh, reaction. Uh, from the authorities here in Tokyo. Uh, to me, I do not see them moving before 152. <coughs> That's when they moved mm -hmm. last time, and so that would look like they're protecting a level. So I think we need to see a sharper move uh, that goes well beyond 152 uh, before they take uh, action. If they can get through this weekend um, uh, and this uh, into the next week, then I think we get into the holding pattern, the waiting game. And the waiting game really is all about the Fed. When is the Fed going to cut rates? Because the cutting speed of the Fed is likely to be much faster than the hiking speed of the BOJ. And that is the key factor that could change the dynamics in the currency market at this point. 
OK, still the essential role of the Fed, of course. Looking at 152 potentially is the next key level for this Japanese currency. Paul Jackson with the excellent context and analysis. Thank you very much indeed. We'll stay on this story at least momentarily and bring in Lilia Petervin, who is the portfolio strategist at Goldman Sachs. Lilia, um, great to have you in the studio. Let's start on Japan, because I know you have views on this. The Nikkei up, what, 50% over the last 12 months. Has the window closed if you want to get exposure to Japanese equities? They're performing well in the session today on the back of cheaper and weaker yen. Does that story continue for the Nikkei? Yes, you're right. That's uh, one of the views we're having. We're, we're positive on equities as an asset class, mm -hmm. and there are some areas outside the U.S., including Japan, on which we are especially positive. In the Japan, we expect profits to grow more than 30% over the next two years, so that's a striking difference with Europe, for instance. And if you look at foreign inflows, which matter a lot for that um, equity market, they've ticked up, but only modestly. And we've not yet seen, for instance, U.S. Uh, investors participating to that rally. So all of this would support probably the Japan equity market okay, higher. So that's the profit story. And to what extent are you thinking about the Japanese in? How important is that as you factor in your views on, on Japanese equities? If we have a significant intervention from Japanese authorities, does that give you pause for thought in terms of your optimism on Japanese stocks? Yeah, you're right. Um, I think Japanese equities make 40% of their sales outside Japan, which is a reasonably high sh share, mm. um, lower than what European equities make outside of Europe, but still reasonably high. So um, we do expect the yen to strengthen, but very modestly, um, and that should not you know, really prevent the Japanese equity market from going where we think it will go. And as we last one on Japan here before we move on to, to the US and Europe, which segments of the Japanese stock basket are looking most attractive, have the most upside potential from here? Well, in Japan, as you know, there's uh, the Tokyo Stock Exchange reform, and we have more than 40, um, 50 percent of um, the Japan equity market, which has already disclosed new metrics and outperformed a lot. There still remains the other half of the Japanese equity market which should do so. So that should be a boost to these stocks. And generally speaking, the market has been very concentrated over there into tech names and AI. Um, the AI theme has been important as well. And just, just as we think um, that should be the case for other equity markets, we think it's time to diversify. Not that we're worried about the um, current winners, mm -hmm. but we do think investors need to diversify their portfolios. OK, from Japan to the US, and US stock still on track for five straight months again. Five straight months again. Are valuations looking, looking a little stretched to you at this point? Do you need to wait for a sell-off, a drawdown in US stocks before adding? Um, I mean, you're right. Um, valuations look particularly stretched. And we mention always the fact that the S&P trades on 20 and a half um, times 12 months forward P, which is probably, you know, in the 90th percentile um, as we speak. Mm -hmm. But even if you exclude the Magnificent Seven, um, we are still traded on um, uh, a percentile which is above the 93rd percentile, so quite high by historical standard. Very different from the picture we have in Europe, where valuations have risen as well, but are just below the long-term average. So yes, it's hard to see, um, you know, um, the multiple on the S&P. Um, going very much higher. That said, our view is that the Magnificent Seven will continue to do well in absolute terms. These mm -hmm. are companies which grow two, three times faster than the market, if you believe consensus. They reinvest for growth as mm -hmm. well, um, three times faster than the rest of the market, which is a good thing for long-term um, prospects. Um, and they have very strong balance sheets. So in absolute terms, they should do well. Um, our view is probably that we'll have a catch-up of other stocks in the S&P, which is healthy. And if I look at the you know, previous few weeks, whether you look at Europe or um, US equities, the rally has been broadening out, which is a healthy mm. thing. Um, and in two okay. thirds of very narrow rallies, historically, you tend to see a catch up of other stocks rather than a correction okay. of the aggregate. I just index. want to bring some breaking news for our viewers because there's a redhead crossing the Bloomberg terminal right now. This is coming from reporting from Reuters that the Japan Ministry of Finance, the BOJ and the FSA will hold a meeting 615 
p.m. local time. So imminently, this meeting will be held between the Japanese Ministry of Finance, the BOJ, and the FSA. That meeting coming up, presumably, the yen will be a focus of that meeting. Talking of the yen, it has strengthened to 151.29. It is now up two tenths of a percent versus the U.S. dollar. We'll keep across this story, of course for you and continue to monitor it. Lilia, when it comes to, we've, we've talked about the US story and your expectation that maybe that, 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 that you see that broadening out even as the MAG7 remains an essential part of the US equity story. Here in Europe, the valuation gap, do you see that valuation gap between European stocks and US stocks closing and how does that evolve that story? Uh, you're right. The, the gap has <coughs> never been as large in terms of 12 months forward PE and many other metrics. Um, and I think that there's scope definitely for Europe to catch up a little bit with the U.S. That said, a lot of that gap owes to long-term, very long-term growth prospects, um, which owe to the AI theme in particular. And it's hard at Is the moment... Is there a real AI theme here in Europe? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's one metric on which Europe has been traded um, similarly to the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, it's when you adjust um, the valuation, the P to expected growth, the peg ratio. Um, even on that metric, actually, the U.S. has started to become a little bit more expensive. And if I look into detail, that's been driven by U.S. tech. That's a U.S. tech peg ratio, which has okay. increased, increased very much. Lilia, fantastic insights. Thank you very much indeed. Lilia Abbe-Tavin, who is the Goldman Sachs, a Goldman Sachs portfolio strategist uh, with the insights across these global markets. Thank you very much indeed. Coming up, H&M reporting earnings this morning. Coming in with a beat. It's the top gainer across the European stocks picture right now. We're going to get more on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. H&M shares on fire this morning, up currently a little over 13%. That's after the Swedish retailer posted better than expected profit in the first quarter following cost cuts and the introduction of a successful new spring range. Let's get more details then with Bloomberg's Jonas Edblom on this story. Jonas, the inaugural earnings then for the, for the new CEO, uh, and, it, and they've come out very strongly. What, what is your takeaway? Clearly, investors are cheering these, these numbers. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a strong jump compared to the uh, the January sales report when shares instead saw a considerable plunge after uh, the now old uh, CEO left as well. And I think what most uh, mostly impressed investors this time around was certainly uh, profitability and uh, margins were, which was both better than expected and as well as like another reassuring report for them where they uh, reiterated their uh, double digit margin target for the year. So. What is, what is, we talked about the new CEO, what is the company's plan then, what is his plan and the management's plan to continue to improve the profitability story at H&M? Yeah, H&M has always, uh, for the past couple of years, really struggled with uh, really high inventories and a uh, higher than average cost when it comes to uh, general admin and, uh, and just... Uh, a higher input costs as well. So, uh, so um, last year they launched a cost cutting and uh, pr and uh, efficiency program, and uh, they're working really hard to reduce inventory. And uh, in this report, they saw uh, a considerable drop in inventories just uh, over the quarter. So, something that is certainly uh, working for them right now. So, the retail sector, H and M, and its counterparts and its competitors, um, responsible for quite a significant carbon carbon footprint. How is the company working to improve sustainability as a as a longer term goal? Yeah, exactly. Um, H and M is really being uh, somewhat attacked from both sides. You got the more affluent, uh, conscious consumers in the West, where uh, they ask for um, more, you know, reasonable. Uh, um, sustainable sustainability credentials but then on the other hand like their incredible core business the fast uh, fast fashion where uh, things move very fast is is attacked from like new upstarts as Shein as well so so they really have to um, mm -hmm. walk a very delicate tightrope walk here and uh, they're trying new efforts for example they launched a new uh, joint venture called Sierra where they recycle polyester for example which is a follow-up from like a previous company which sadly failed uh, because they couldn't get profitability 
OK, Bloomberg's Jonas Ekblom, thank you very much indeed on the context around the earnings beat for H&M. As you can see, the stock is up currently a little over 13%, the leading gainer across the European market today. There's much more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back now. Japan's Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Japan and the Financial Services Agency, the FSA, they are holding a meeting right now, according to reporting from Reuters. We are expecting, the press is expecting to be briefed by Japan's top currency official on the back of this meeting. The Japanese yen has moved on these reports. There is a move lower for US dollar Japanese yen. So the yen strengthening by three tenths of percent. 151.11 now. This follows, of course, commentary, sharp worded commentary from officials in Japan, from the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Finance, the Finance Minister earlier this morning saying that he would not hesitate to intervene if needed, that they are watching and scrutinizing the weakness in the Japanese yen. We know that's a concern to them. The rate differential, when you look at the US 10 year, and the JGB 10-year, that differential remains pronounced, of course. That continues to pressure the Japanese yen. This meeting happening now, we keep across this story for you. Coming up, we'll be discussing how the US and its allies are facing the Houthis. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You are watching The Pulse here on Bloomberg TV. Japan steps closer to intervention as the yen slumps to its lowest level against the dollar since 1990. The yen getting a pop, though, on the back of this reporting. The Ministry of Finance, Bank of Japan and Financial Services Agency are currently holding a meeting. That's according to Reuters. From cars to coal, the dramatic collapse of the Baltimore Bridge will cause weeks, even months of transport delays, adding another disruption to global trade. Plus, H&M jumps. The fashion retailer posts better than expected profit in the first quarter. As its spring range draws shoppers, the stock surges. Good morning. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Let's check in then on these markets. We look at US futures and, of course, the European benchmark. After a day, a fresh day of records for European stocks yesterday. Today, though, Downside, modest downside across the European benchmark. The stock 600 off so far this Wednesday session by just a tenth of a percent. The retail story, of course, is pronounced with the earnings beat coming through from H&M. That's on the positive. S&P futures pointed to the gains of three tenths of a percent. You are still set for five straight months of gains for U.S. stocks, despite the last three days and the downside that's come through today, a brighter picture for U.S. equity markets. Nasdaq futures also pointing to add gains of around 64 points, 18,511. Let's flip the board and look cross asset then. Obviously, the asset at the moment is the Japanese yen. You've seen the strength coming through on the back of this reporting about a meeting that is going on right now. Again, according to Reuters, the Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Japan and the FSA all meeting right now. We're expecting a briefing after that meeting. But the currency, the Japanese yen, has strengthened on the back of that reporting up two tenths of a percent at 151.20. But it's the weakness of the currency more broadly that is of concern for these officials. The Brent trading at $85 a barrel, a drop of 1% on reporting around an inventory buildup in the US. We keep across the energy space for you, of course, as well. Let's return now to the Baltimore bridge collapse and take a closer look at the impact on trade and, of course, the already stretched supply chains in the US, but globally as well. The consequence is expected to stretch out for weeks, potentially, and will hit industries ranging from coal to cars. Let's get the details with Bloomberg Markets today, anchor Kriti Gupta. Kriti, uh, where do we stand in terms of what we know about this disaster and the impact economically, Baltimore, the US, and globally? Well, let's we'll start with the human toll first. Yeah. So six rescue workers uh, or will not be rescued, sadly. At least that's the assumption of the Coast Guard. Not to be found alive, just given that the water current and the darkness around it, those too prolonged to actually see any hopes of life there. 
there. That being said, it is turning from in a rescue and search mission to a recovery mission in terms of the actual bodies. That being said, the crew members on the ship were not hurt. The traffic halted on both sides, so uh, a little bit of a human toll escaped there as well. From an economic perspective, we're talking about a lot of rerouting when it comes to the Port of Baltimore. You mentioned it, coal, cars, agricultural products, deer, for example, using it as kind of the export for a lot of its farming infrastructure and the equipment and machinery that it sends out. That being said, you're now seeing obviously higher rates in the Port of New York, the Port of uh, Virginia Beach as well, which are the other two major ports on the eastern seaboard, as well as the West Coast as well. Now, what's important for our European audience is that the well, Port of Baltimore's historic partners have been Germany, the UK, Japan, again, really tying into that cars and auto making space. The recovery efforts at the moment, however, in building back the Port of Baltimore seem to be weeks, months, potentially even years, depending on how the funding looks out of the Biden administration. On the funding question then, the president promising that this will be a federally funded renovation of this bridge. What is your understanding of the politics behind that? Are both sides likely to approve that funding? Is that a simple case of getting the money through Congress? It's going to get approved and then it gets to the build out of the bridge or is it going to be more complicated than that? Um, you could argue it both ways. And you've mm. seen certainly both rhetoric here. I'll start with the kind of the historic norm, which is that when you do have disasters like these, you do tend to see federal governments rebuild these bridges. Now, this will have an extra push from the Biden administration because especially ahead of the election and as part of his Inflation Reduction Act, infrastructure has been high on the docket. And that's usually something that's associated with GOP nominees and the GOP docket. So for the Biden administration and Democrats, especially to be pushing this, is crucial. But also talk about the area that we're in. Remember, there's a lot of union workers in that area. There's the U.S. Naval Academy there as well. Uh, President Biden has made multiple statements at the Port of Baltimore as well in terms of really kind of rallying the union crowd. And he himself is talking about how that all fits into the broader picture of really fighting for wages, work, wages, uh, working rights in this inflationary environment. We should also mention the area is significant because the union, the largest union for some of those marine workers, not only located in that area, but have wage negotiations mm -hmm. coming up as well into September. So there's a lot of political factors that certainly feed into this. The funding, it's unclear where it's coming from, but we do know that authorities have said it's going to be a priority. OK, Kriti Gupta with a deep dive on the broader implications of this bridge collapse story, of course, in Baltimore. Markets Today anchor Kriti Gupta. Thank you. Now, Ford's CFO says the, the Baltimore bridge collapse will affect its own supply chain. As Kriti was saying, auto is clearly impacted by this. He says the company will start to reroute car parts to other East Coast ports. It's a large port with a lot of uh, flow through it, so it's going to have an impact. It's just at this point, we'll have to understand what that means for us specifically. We'll work on the workarounds. We'll have to divert parts to other ports along the East Coast or elsewhere in the country, and it'll probably lengthen the supply chain a bit. OK, we're going to be hearing as well from the CEO of Volkswagen North America later today. We're going to get his view, of course, on the supply chain impact for his business. Don't miss that interview, 12.45 p.m. UK time. Now, the U.S. and its allies have been trying to stop the Iran-backed Houthis, but attacks on commercial and military ships continue. Let's bring in Sylvia Westall, Bloomberg Economy and Government Managing Editor for the Middle East, for the details on this story, which, of course, impacts another part of the supply chain issue globally. Sylvia, how have then shipping companies reacted to the threat of attack in the Red Sea? Is anything that the U.S. and its partner, the U.K., doing militarily helping to assuage and reassure those shipping companies? Yes, I mean, we've seen a complete change in that global shipping route. Uh, people are now going around southern Africa. It's putting, you know, a two weeks on top of the normal uh, time for freight to move through the seas. Um, and even though there is this mission led by the US uh, to act as deterrence in these waters, um, there's warships, there's heavy equipment, uh, there's this coalition of, of uh, vessels in that area, uh, the attacks are still continuing on, on commercial vessels. And so that means that companies have to make the choice, do they sail through it or not? Um, the CEO of Hapagloid, the German company, uh, said in an earnings call earlier this month that it's a binary choice. Either it's safe for their people to go through these waters Waters, or it is not. Um, so companies really have a yes or no option. Um, so even if, you know, to some extent the US is saying that they have been able to degrade uh, the Houthis and the attacks they're able to carry out, if there are still events happening, then global companies do avoid there. And this is a really important area. I mean, it's, it was carrying around 50%, uh, 15 percent of global commerce. Um, and we've really seen a big rerouting of that traffic now.
What is the outlook then, Sylvia? What is the expectation from shipping companies, from the military, the militaries of the US and the UK, as to how long this goes on for, how long this disruption is going to have to be baked into some of these decisions? Well, one of my colleagues, Peter Martin, was recently on one of the U.S. vessels um, and there was a discussion about this taking months. Um, they're preparing for a long haul. Uh, if you look at some of the global company expectations, some of them have uh, revised their expectations for freight costs throughout the rest of 2024. And some are saying that this could carry on until 2025. So in terms of how long this is going to impact, it's going to take several months, if not toward the end of the year, at least if you talk to companies and people who are involved in these missions to protect these waters. Okay, Sylvia Westall, really important reporting coming from Sylvia and the team. Bloomberg's managing editor for economy and government in the Middle East, Russia and Africa. Thank you. Coming up, U.S. business leaders, including Blackstone's Stephen Schwartzman, meet the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, in Beijing as the nation tries to restore confidence in its economy. Will the charm offensive work? We have the details. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, shares in China's BYD, the world's top-selling electric car maker, closed more than 6% lower after posting a small, a small earnings miss. The lackluster performance stands in contrast to some of its smaller competitors in the country's highly competitive EV market. Let's bring in then, for the context, Bloomberg's global auto editor, Craig Trudell. Another line crossing out of the auto market of China. This Neo coming through. The ADR is falling 3% after cutting their first quarter delivery target. So just building out that picture for us, that there is softness now coming through for the EV story in China. BUID, of course, the biggest player in China, the biggest player uh, globally, Craig. What do, you, what do you make of the earnings story from BUID? What does it tell us more broadly about the demand for these autos? I like your emphasis on small because the, the miss here was uh, a very slim margin. Mm -hmm. And after all, it was also, um, you know, this, this was a company that had released preliminary results weeks earlier. And so it really wasn't vastly different from the, the range that the company had already given. But I think it did just sort of, you know, reinforce these concerns that, that uh, have just been building month after month, that there is an EV slowdown, that this company is, uh, you know, prioritizing sales growth over profitability. We saw this trend last year that they were building deliveries quarter by quarter, uh, building profit along with that, but that broke down in the fourth quarter. And we're just seeing sort of signals that the company is sending to the market that they're okay with plowing ahead with that, that, you know, they're, they're putting emphasis on, you know, 20% growth uh, forecast for the year. They want to keep growing. They're not interested in, in sort of backing down and sort of, you know, going along with this idea that, you know, the consumer is pushing back a little bit. Okay. Can we expect the Chinese government, Chinese officials saying they want the consumer to be able to have the scope to buy and replace products, cars are part of the mix. Are we expecting any response from regulators and officials in, in China to help, uh, whether it's subsidies, uh, to, to kind of spur, spur this market? And, and tying into that question, the export market now for, for Chinese companies like BYD, increasingly important as they kind of push overseas. Those two elements as we look ahead then for how this evolves. Yeah, the, the government is kind of caught between a rock and a hard place here because on one hand it's it's trying to fight these battles with the EU and the US over you know the subsidizing of its market if it you know sort of comes to the rescue kind of undermines the argument that it's mounting as of yesterday with the WTO uh, with the US uh, with the mm. EU uh, you know tariffs are on the way there as a result of the anti-subsidy investigation that was launched last year uh, they also have this uh, situation where they still probably have too many manufacturers in this in this uh, you know space uh, Neo is just the latest of the smaller players to come out with uh, softer numbers uh, and, and sort of, you know, downplay how much uh, it's how many sales it's going to have this quarter. And so does there need to be more consolidation here as opposed to, you know, this constant kind of coming in and, and uh, you know, coming to the rescue of these companies? that are underperforming and not executing. And that's really, the question. Really, really important story. And, and the context always excellent from Craig today. Thank you very much indeed, of course, who leads our autos coverage uh, across, of course, uh, Bloomberg. With the context on that story, BYD, but a much broader story evolving as a result of that. So let's get back to the lines crossing when it comes to Japan and the yen, of course. We have had this uh, meeting. It was reported by, by Reuters. The meeting, it seems, has concluded.
included a meeting between the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance and the FSA, the Financial Stability Authority. And a speaker now coming through from the Ministry of Finance, Masoto Kanda, speaking after that meeting, saying they cannot tolerate speculative moves in the FX market. Kanda saying that 4% FX moves in two weeks are not moderate. They are not ruling out any options regarding Forex. They are watching Forex with a high level of urgency. Kanda of the Ministry of Finance of Japan saying they are seeing clear speculative moves in the FX market in Japan. Kanda saying that the US-Japan rate differential is narrowing and confirming an economic virtuous cycle in Japan. But the key lines are they are re-emphasizing their willingness to monitor and potentially intervene. We are always prepared, says Kanda, to address abnormal situations. 151.27 on the Japanese yen, strengthening two-tenths of a percent. We continue to watch this story for you. The briefing on the back of this meeting between the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance and the FSA. We continue to maintain readiness to act as usual. So, so far, it's the jawboning that continues from Japanese officials. But as we've been reporting and our team in Tokyo have suggested, 152 is probably the line in the sand for officials. We're currently 151. We keep across this story for you, of course, throughout today's programming. Now, China's President Xi Jinping has met with U.S. business executives in Beijing, including Blackstone's Stephen Schwartzman, a regular to Beijing, and Qualcomm's Cristiano Amon, as the nation looks to shore up confidence amid a slowdown in foreign investment. And that slowdown last year was pronounced. Global business leaders are also gathering at China's annual Boao Forum in Hainan, the Asian version, some would describe it, of the World Economic Forum in Davos. Bloomberg's Lucille Liu joins us from Beijing, though, with the details, not enjoying the tropical climate of Hainan. Lucille, uh, what are other executives uh, attending the meeting? What have they been saying? How significant is that meeting between U.S. executives, foreign executives and the Chinese president? Hi, Tom. Yeah, that's right. We've been hearing a lot about this meeting uh, leading up to this week. Of course, there was the China Development Forum just over the weekend. A lot of these CEOs were at that forum. Um, and of course, we're also seeing a lot of these CEOs were at that San Francisco dinner back in November when C was uh, at the APEC summit. So um, a lot of people are describing this sort of as a continuity of that stabilization of the increased dialogue. And of course, at this meet, C did tell this group of CEOs that, you know, invest in China. And he also talked about the domestic economy, saying, you know, China hasn't collapsed because of the China collapse theory, and it's not going to peak because uh, of the, you know, uh, the China peak theory. So, uh, you know, just striking a confident tone for the economy and uh, on U.S.-China relations, uh, talking about the stabilization. And Lucille, I know you've been covering the Boao, uh, the, the, the forum. Well, there's the Boao forum, of course, but you're also covering uh, the China Development Forum. Uh, tell us about what you've been hearing at both of those events from, from business executives. Is it your sense, speaking to executives, Lucille, that they are now regaining some level of confidence in the Chinese market? Well, I think it's, uh, the main thing is that executives don't invest because things are good for three months, four months, five months. You know, they're looking at a couple of years. And of course, we have that upcoming election in November. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to say if this is the calm before the storm or if this is going to be some sort of stabilization that's lasting. Um, and so, I mean, executives definitely are striking a very positive tone. We had Tim Cook in Beijing, you know, saying how much he loves China and the Chinese people, how dynamic it is here, mm. uh, really talking up the partners and suppliers, many other CEOs as well, you know, praising China for some of its recent moves. Um, but again, they're, you know, they're speaking to the d domestic audience. They're speaking, you know, they're trying to help their local teams here um, kind of build business. So, um, you know, it's been a lot of praise, um, but it's hard to know if this is lasting. What are you watching for, Lucille, you and the team, between now and those U.S. elections in November? On the policy front, in terms of what could move the dial, in terms of the relationship between Beijing and Washington, or on the economic front, in terms of additional policy to support this economy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, we had that speech actually from Li Tiang at the China Development Forum um, where he, you know, talked about Chinese manufacturing. He talked about sort of this drive. And uh, of course, people were asking, well, where are the sort of demand side uh, aspects of this? Um, and so I think that's a big thing people are looking for. Are there going to be more demand side drivers or is this a doubling down on manufacturing and that's it? 
Um, we're certainly looking forward to see if the third plenum will happen, um, and uh, mm. as they, you know, often announce economic reforms. And of course, today C did say something to the U.S. CEOs. He said, you know, China is. Uh, implementing, but also planning uh, major reforms. Um, and so that could hint at something, but of course it's hard to tell. Um, and so we're definitely looking to see if there is any shifts in policies or new stimulus or anything to uh, boost consumer confidence. Okay, Lucille Liu, thank you very much indeed in Beijing on the latest of uh, the Boao Forum, but also the China Development Forum and the importance of these meetings between U.S. and foreign executives with the Chinese leadership. We appreciate it. Coming up, former President Donald Trump's social media startup has added billions to his fortune, at least on paper, but legal strains still threaten his finances. We'll get the details. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, former President Donald Trump's social media startup gained 16% in its first trading day as a public company. The newly public company has added billions to Trump's fortune, at least, at least on paper. There's a lot of lockup deal uh, and detail in that. But legal strains uh, still threaten his finances. For the details, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Charlie Wells, who's been covering this story for us. Uh, Charlie, Donald Trump then richer than ever on paper, but still facing uh, quite a momentous and significant legal fortune as well. Legal financial hit, I should say. Yeah, I mean, the past few days have been kind of char characteristically Trump in that there's sort of, you know, too much, but also never enough to quote a book about him by his niece. And look, he got a boost on paper, mm -hmm. um, particularly from DJT, Trump Media, which kind of backed into a SPAC. He's got $4.6 billion coming from the value of those assets right now. And so his, you know, worth is now $7.2 billion that landed him on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Those are the assets. But he's still, as you mentioned, got significant significant liabilities. He got a bit of a reprieve in some of these legal liabilities this week. A bond was reduced um, in a New York fraud lawsuit from about $500 million to about $175 million. But that's on appeal. And so the mm. issue is if, you know, he loses the appeal, if that verdict stands, he could still have to pay about $500 million. He could still have to pay about $83 million in another lawsuit. And he also faces four criminal lawsuits, two about, about allegedly trying to overturn the U.S. election. And so, yes, boost in assets, but still legal liabilities mounting. OK, Charlie Wills, thank you very much indeed on the fortunes, the mixed fortunes then, of course, of Trump, former President Trump and, of course, the nominee for the Republican Party for that November vote. Charlie, thank you very much indeed. Let's get back to the story around the Japanese yen then. We've had this meeting between the BOJ, the Ministry of Finance, and the FSA in Tokyo, of course. We've had some details on that in terms of their attempts to put something of a floor under the Japanese yen. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ven Ram from our MLive team, who's been writing about about this on the M Live, on the Bloomberg terminal, on Bloomberg.com as well. Then, what is your sense as to whether or not the goals and the targets of Japanese officials around the Japanese currency are being achieved with this jawboning? 151.33 on the Japanese yen right now. No, I think the job owning is falling short of what the market expects, Tom, clearly. I mean, we went into this meeting with the VN completely misaligned with fundamentals. And for them, at least the initial sound bites that we are hearing from the MOF are that, you know, the currency has deviated from its fundamentals, 4% moves in the space of two weeks is overstated and all that, which is, yes, which is very well known and acknowledged by the markets. So for them to go into a special huddle and come up with more of this verbal job owning means that, you know, they are not really taking the speculators head on. And that will only strengthen the hands of the speculators, play into their hands. And that means that the yen will quickly give up those gains, those fleeting gains that we have seen in the past half an hour or so, and then go back into losses. The, the yen needs a lot more to recover from here. Really important context on this big day for the Japanese currency. Ven Ram from our MLive team, we appreciate it. Surveillance is ahead. This is Bloomberg.